So this is my game against uh, Jeffrey from round two. So right now I'm zero out of one, I lost to Ray. And Jeffrey was 2,700 on the dot. So obviously I've played him before. You guys all know who he is. And I decided to go for uh, an opening that I had actually never played before in classical, which is the Kali system. And the Kali system is like a London with one, it's also called the Zucker Tor. Uh, th there's one key difference. In the London, you, you play bishop f4. In the Kali, you go e3, and then the bishop fianchettos. So it, it actually, it's like a distant cousin to the London. And the reason it isn't quite as related as people might assume is because there are some shared ideas. But um, in the London, obviously, as you guys know, you usually play e3 and c3, you build the pawn triangle, right? In the Kali, you don't go c3, you fianchetto. So it's like a completely different type of piece arrangement. And so the ideas that stem from it are also very different. Why did I go for this opening? Well, uh, it was... On the advice of Peter, actually, I have to give him credit for this. Because, again, I didn't want to go for something mainstream. Jeffrey plays a lot of different things against 1e4, and I knew that he would prepare for that. So I wanted to drag him out, out of theory, and get a position that, you know, forces him to show his understanding. Well, the thing is, uh, the commentators were caught off guard. I mean, the Kali is not actually a defensive opening. I think a lot of people think that just because of the way that it looks, but in reality, it's it's a very aggressive positional system, and uh, it's not anything like you know a force draw or anything like that. I think a lot of people tend to jump to conclusions just because they the, the visually the effect of this move you think it's quite passive. Okay, so Jeffrey plays c5, the main move, and first I play knight bd2, which is the modern modern way to the modern way to to play here, and the point of this move is that if black continues knight c6, then I actually take the pawn. And it's not so easy to recover this pawn in a good way. Because after e5, I have bishop b5, pinning the knight and threatening e5. And if he goes e6, there's a very typical way to respond to the threat of bishop takes c5. Does anybody know what it is? If you play the queen's gambit with black, this idea exists in many different types of openings. Well, you can't go b4, he just takes the pawn. But you got to prepare that. You go a3, you basically say, here, here, come take my pawn. But what you're going to give me is you're going to give me a nice, nice little wedge. Now the bishop comes out to b2, and white is slightly better here, because this uh, c-pawn will advance to c4. The other bishop is going to come to d3. This is like a dream collie setup. And black has a very hard time here developing adequately. So... So that's the point of knight bd2. It's aimed against knight c6. So Jeffrey goes e6, which I think is a good move. Okay, so b3, b6, bishop b2, bishop d6, developing, bishop d3. And here Jeffrey plays in a rather unusual way. I don't think the, the system that he chose is particularly good. I mean, generally, black just goes bishop b7. This is the main line. Castles, castles. And here white has an assortment of moves, knight e5. And f4 is the typical idea. This is the old move. All right, what's going on? But uh, that's not the only move. You could also play c4 here. And uh, you could also play a neutral move like queen e2 to connect the rooks. I, I, I hadn't entirely decided what I wanted to do yet. Um, could you just castle before bishop e7? Thank you, Ubaris, for the prime. I'm not sure what you're asking. Like, where, in which position. But anyways, Jeffrey takes on d4, which was a little surprising to me. I didn't really see what he was gaining from that trade. And now he plays bishop a6, revealing the idea, thanks Origarin, of his previous move. He's trying to trade light squared, light squared bishops, which is obviously good for black. Because if, if white is left with just the bishop on b2, then the system kind of becomes lame. So, no, this is not an IQP. I have a c pawn. So this is not, not technically an IQP. And so I have to find a way to preserve this bishop. Fortunately, there is a way to do that, and that is the move pawn c4. Um, this essentially cuts into the bishop on a6, leaves it kind of awkward, and, whoops, no, he didn't do that. And I think this is just a nice position for white. This bishop just isn't doing that much. So castles, castles, and bd7. And Jeffrey was playing pretty quickly here, which led me to believe that he had prepared this system, but I actually don't think he did. Okay, so 
this is a, a really nice setup, and now I continue to play in typical Kali style, knight e5, rook c8, and f4. And I was really happy with the outcome of the opening. I mean, everything is perfectly placed. Generally, the drawback of the move f4 is that this e4 square is weakened, right? I mean, if black can stick a knight on e4, generally he neutralizes the initiative. But here, this bishop on a6 is misplaced. Black would wish that the bishop is on b7 so that he could play knight e4. But now if he goes back to b7, which he did, which he did, I have time to secure the e4 square. So I went queen e2 in order to connect the rooks number one, but more importantly, can, uh, take control of the e4 square. Okay. Jeffrey quickly... Oh, sorry. Jeffrey quickly plays the move rook c7. Thank you for a player chess. And I didn't really understand the idea of this move until his next move. It turns out that this is a relatively common idea in these types of positions. The point is to bring this queen all the way into the corner to a8 to create a battery. And the point of that battery, number one, is to aim at the g2 pawn. But mo most importantly, he's still trying to take control of the e4 square. But it's kind of a losing battle because now I bring my rook to e1. He plays queen a8, but he's not really threatening to put a knight on e4. So there are no threats in this position, and I've got more time to improve my position. And here I made a very speculative decision. I think, objectively, my next move is probably a mistake. I think it's overambitious. But in reality, it created a lot of chaos in the position, and it turned out really well. So it's not really a conceptual mistake. I just think that I could have played a neutral move like a3, controlling the b4 square. Yeah, and then g4, g5. I mean, that's, I think, probably the most effective plan. That's what the engine gives. Black's position is really unpleasant here. He has no clear way to improve. And yeah, the plan is to go g4, g5 and checkmate him. But for some reason, I didn't really consider the concept of playing slowly. I wanted to strike immediately. I wanted to strike immediately, and I did. So I decided, all right, everything is in place. Let's open up the center. And I went f5. And I thought this is a very natural move given how passive his pieces are placed. He takes f5 and um, rook takes f5. Looks, looks excellent, but there's a couple of tactical subtleties here that I failed to incorporate in my thinking. First, Jeffrey plays a really nice move, rook e8. Okay, he pins the knight. This also doesn't create any threats, and I figured now I have more time to improve my position, so I'm going to go rook e f1 and double on the f file. I'm going to try to get this knight off of f6. I was already thinking about sacking on f6. But now another very strong move that I had underestimated, rook e6. And now I started to get a little bit concerned. Because the more I thought about this position, the less I saw how to improve my position. I just didn't understand how I actually break through. I, I didn't see a way to get rid of this knight. I thought about g4, but this is way too brazen and weakening. And now this battery actually kills me. He plays knight takes e5 and bishop c5 check, and I'm busted. I can't get my king to, the H, to, to this diagonal because he takes to the discovery. So can I try to get my queen to g3? Yeah, so I could try a move like queen e1 here. But again, after knight e5, d5, bishop c5, it's the same problem. You relinquish control of g2. Here, here, and black's position all of a sudden springs to life, and it's actually just checkmate. So I, I thought for maybe 15 minutes here, 15, 20 minutes, I just could not find anything super convincing. And I decided to essentially change the nature of the position, which a decision that the computer really likes. And I was really proud of this after the game because it looks bad, but actually it breathes new life into the position. Yeah, so knight f3 is interesting, but here he can play h6 to stop the knight from coming to g5. And then potentially he can stick his knight into e4. Um, so I decided to do something interesting. I took on d5. Looks like it plays right into black's hands. Now I do have an IQP. And now I give him full control of this diagonal, but I have thought one step ahead and I go knight dc4. And this is the whole point of, of capturing. Now this knight participates in the game. I'm hitting the bishop. And the point is that if he brings his bishop back to f8, I can swing this knight back to e3 and um, try to get rid of this bishop on d5. And later on, I can play maybe the move d5 to open up my bishop on b2. So I, I felt like this was the way to continue the initiative, and the engine actually likes this decision. There's a couple of really, really cool lines that I had calculated. Um, and this position is tremendously complicated. So I know Agen moderated a video on this game, and 
I feel like looking at these positions can be pretty overwhelming. Um, no, white is better here. I think white is quite a bit better. But again, the point is that if you just move the bishop back to b7, I play knight takes d7, he can't take with a knight. And now there's a very thematic and very powerful sacrifice, rook takes f6. If he takes with a rook, then it's very simple. Takes, takes, queen g4, hitting the rook. If he takes with the pawn, then I play queen g4 check, king h8, and the simple d5 opens up the bishop and wins the game. I mean, everything is collapsing here. This is totally crushing. You feel completely lost conceptually here. Well, I think such positions, like you can deconstruct them by understanding the individual components, right? There's a sum total of stuff that's going on here. Like the first thing you could notice is that white's got pressure. Where's white's pressure coming from? Well, white's pressure is coming from a couple of different sources, right? The first source of pressure is the F file. All right, you've got these rooks double in the f-file. How should you think about that? Well, one way to think about that is to understand that this knight on f6 essentially is paralyzed. The, the second thing to understand is that I can later on, not now, but later I can sacrifice on f6 in order to open up his king. We've already seen that. And what people have trouble with is when I say that, you think, well, I don't get it. You know, one knight defends the other. What do I mean I can sack on f6? Clearly that's not possible, but I'm not talking about it now. Because the position is so complicated, there, there can be a lot of trades and transformations that go on in a short period of time, and that can open up the possibility for various tactics. Uh, the second source of white's pressure is the bishop placement. Now, it's easy to see why this bishop is good. I'm it's aiming at the king, right? But this bishop on b2, in order to explain why it's good, I have to invoke the idea of potential energy, which I've used before, kinetic and potential energy. You look at this bishop, you say it's a terrible bishop. It's blockaded by the bishop on d5. This pawn can never move. But I argue that this bishop on d5 is actually not as stable as it seems. And that's why I did this whole thing, because this knight wants to swing back to e3. And once I get rid of this bishop, then the move d5 comes in. And then the bishop on b2 becomes an absolute beast. And we just saw a line where that happened. Bishop f8, knight e3. And if he drops his bishop back, you know, I, I clear the air a little bit. And then later... Uh, sorry, gf6, queen g4, king h8, and here comes d5, and all these pieces start to breathe. So it's one of those situations where it doesn't look that impressive visually, but there's a lot going on behind the scenes and under the surface that's causing uh, black's position to be very shaky. So seeing all of that, Jeffrey uh, decided on an option that I had honestly completely overlooked. Why not play d5 immediately, but where? And the, you physically can't do that here. Oh, why not play d5 here? Actually, d5 here is a great move. According to the engine, it's it's the second best move. So you absolutely can play d5 here. Yeah, no, this is a good move too. And black's position kind of collapses. The Jeffrey took on e5. And I guess in my mind, I didn't consider this because I, I thought I have a fork, but there's really no fork because he's pinning my pawn to the queen. And in addition to that, he's got this nasty check on c5. I didn't take this idea seriously. I just... I felt like he's doing my work for me because now this knight is under pressure. Uh, but it, it turns out that, again, there's a lot under the surface. And when Jeffrey played knight e4, I was a little bit terrified because all of a sudden black creates a mate threat out of the blue, out of nowhere. When I do my puzzle, puzzle solving video, videos, I always point out situations where your king has no squares. Just that single observation often creates and sets the table for tactical ideas. Yeah, so as already some of you are pointing out, let's make a random move, knight g3, hg3, and now one very important subtlety. Rook h6 is not mate. I have rook h5, but now the queen is overloaded. And the bishop takes g2 is totally devastating. The queen is overloaded. If you take, then this is mate, because the queen is pinned. And if you don't take, then black takes on f1, and again, the queen is overloaded. You can't take the bishop because you lose the rook. Everything collapses. Everything collapses. Um, so this is a massive threat and it's not so easy to defend against because you might say, well, let me take this g3 square under control. I'm going to go queen g4, but now you walk into rook g6 and this is totally terrible. So it's, it's not clear how to solve this problem. I mean, if you take the knight, I didn't want to do that because now you give up your light squared bishop and black has massive pressure on g2. So as he was thinking about this position, I had already spotted the correct idea 
against knight e4. But without this idea, black would be better. Like here I found a sequence of only moves. This is what I was most proud of. This is one of my best stretches in the tournament, I think. Uh, I was really I was able to solve to correctly solve the problems in this position using creativity, using logical thinking, and I was really happy about that. And this is what you need to do to beat these guys to beat these guys. So don't even care suggesting rook one f3. Uh decent move. Decent move, just kind of put your weight against this diagonal, but it doesn't create any threats. He can just improve his position, shifting his rook to d7. Now there's another source of pressure, the d-file. Don't like it, right? I mean, this rook is under an x-ray. So, well, b4 does not address... b4 is an attempt to distract the bishop, which I saw. So I spotted the idea of b4. The point of this is you're getting the bishop away from this diagonal so that the king can breathe. Unfortunately, it doesn't work immediately. Who can tell me why? Why does b4 not work here? Does black have to take on b4? Or no. Black uses the concept of BSD, equal or stronger threat. And b4 doesn't actually stop this entire sequence. It, he doesn't give a damn about this pawn. It's like trying to kill a, a dinosaur by, you know, stubbing its toe or something. It's like, all right, I don't care if the bishop is hitting. I'm doing the same thing I did previously. Yeah. So... The point here is to start by going rook 5f4, which is a very functional move. The point is to, number one, attack the knight. Number two, to take this thing out of this idea, because now rook h4 covers, and the queen is no longer overloaded. Now the pawn on g3 has the responsibility of defending h4. There is no follow-up by wins. Now it turns out that the knight is almost trapped. He has no good squares. If he drops the knight back to g5, well, this knight is tremendously awkward, and I can keep pursuing it by playing rook g4. But of course, Jeffrey had seen that, and he had cooked up a really powerful counter, counter blow, f5. And uh, this uses tactics to secure the knight. If I take on f5 yet again, he's got the same idea that starts with knight g3. If I take on Passant, I open up this discovery, knight g3 wins the queen. And I have a, a check on f7, but it doesn't do anything, he just takes it. So I can't take this pawn in either of the two ways. But what's important to recognize here is that knight g3 is now no longer a threat. I still have this mechanism, right, with rook h4. I hope everyone's following so far. And now comes the opportunity that I have to dislodge the bishop from c5 and get my king some breathing room to short circuit, essentially, his main tactical weapon, which is this knight g3 idea. You cryptic panda. How do I do that? Well, we already know how to do that. Do that by sacking a pawn and going b4. And... This was the decisive moment in the game because Jeffrey, I think, committed close to the decisive error in this position. I had seen the correct move in the game and I was hoping that Jeffrey wouldn't find it. Jeffrey instantly took the pawn. He, he didn't really consider any other options and he told me after the game that he didn't, didn't even, you know, the, the correct idea didn't occur to him. Does anybody, can anybody spot a very powerful counter blow here for black? Th there's actually two of them really funnily enough, and both of them would have created a lot more chances for a successful defense. Yeah, the first is g5. Just basically say, I'm going to counterattack your rook. And if, you know, again, you can't take because this is mate. So here I would have been forced to sacrifice an exchange, which, which I plan to do. And I still think that white's attack is very powerful. Now the king is really weak, and I no longer have to worry about knight g3. Uh, so I think white is better here, but the position remains very complex. But the second idea, which I was even more scared of, is b5. Double idea. The first is you're attacking the knight. And if you just move the knight, then the bishop is going to have a b6 square that he can drop back to. So what I was planning to do here is something really complex. And if you take on c5, then he takes on c4. And I think black is fine here, because without white's knight... There's no piece that can really get rid of this knight anymore. All of a sudden, everything is sort of protected. Black can just play g6 to support f5, and the position is really complex, but I don't think white is better. Now, the computer in was indicating some crazy resources here. There's knight a3 and bishop takes e4, and apparently white is better, but it's super complicated, and even I was not fully on board with all the complex complexities here. I wasn't sure what was going on. So, I... Um, let me check on the Warriors are playing. I don't want to miss. This is not. I'm not missing this game. This is the season opener. They're playing at nine. Cool. All right. 
So uh, he didn't see that. He didn't see that. I'm not going to analyze this right now. Just suffice it to say that you can turn the engine on and dig around. White is better. And apparently the best move is bishop takes e4 and now just simply knight back to d2. Essentially saying that both of these bishops are now hanging. Um, but I decided to cross that bridge. When we get there, Jeffrey takes on b4. And now I have time to shift my knight back to e3. This was the original idea. And all of a sudden, the wheels come off Black's position completely. Because look at what's hanging. F5 is hanging. He can't give this away. If he gives away F5, then the, the support for the knight, uh, you know, the, everything comes crashing down. But he also really does not want to give up his light square bishop. Because if he gives that bishop up, you can kind of spot how many light square weaknesses he has. His king is in big trouble in the long run. So Jeffrey played the only thing he could play, which is g6. He can't give this pawn up. But now I start by pushing the bishop away from b4. Get out of here. And now I take on d5. And this is the most important position in the whole game. Or the second most important. I'd say this was, you know, crucial point number one. And this is crucial point number two, where, again, I, I had to find the only way to put the... I mean, this is an only move. Otherwise, black is fine. And yeah, that's the move queen f3. But what's the idea? Well, I would love to play bishop c4, right? That's like an ideal move, but I can't do it. Nor can I support it. That's the problem with giving away the b pawn. I can also play bishop takes e4, but this is not impressive. Even though I have doubled rooks on the fl, I don't have a check on f8. So I can take on e4 and equalize, but this is not very impressive, right? I mean, position is about equal. Didn't want that. But I, I, I said, wait a second. I have this idea in my pocket, right? So what I what I started to think about is what if I play queen f3 here? Or what if I create a pin? But mainly I'm threatening now to take on e4. So let's say he let's make a random move. Now after bishop b4, f4, I'm tripled on the f file, and I have whoops, sorry, no, not that. I have checkmate. I broke f8 with with a mating attack. King g7, queen f7, etc. So it turns out that it's not easy for black to defend all of his weak spots. If he goes back to c8 then I can really harass this f-pawn by playing g4. And his position collapses again. He can't defend f5. Black has no moves here. That's it. That's literally it. I play gf5 on the next move. Everything collapses. He's got no discoveries either because my queen is well protected. This is not scary. Right? Okay, I hope everyone's following so far. So Jeffrey, I think, plays an only move. He plays knight c3. He tries to, you know, jump out of the burning plane. But here I have prepared a really powerful combination, which transforms the game into something resembling a technically winning endgame, but still, I think, an endgame where he has good drawing chances. Who sees the, this combination? It's a very simple combination. I mean, it uses the fact that the queen on d5 and the rook on e6 are all very flimsy. It's not bishop takes c3. Not bishop takes c3, because he takes the queen and then he takes c3. This almost works. Rook takes f3, rook takes c3, bishop takes f5 exists. This almost wins the game. But unfortunately, he goes rook e c6, and he's fine. Of course, the point is, if you take on f3, I take on e6. So not that. So this is the right idea, but the wrong execution. Here, you're giving up f4. But that's the right idea. You just got to change up the move order. You just got to change up the move order. You first play bishop c4. Okay, you force him to take it. So if he takes the queen, then you take on e6 with check. And now you take the queen. And again, he has to take the queen. And now you take the rook. And now there's one super important point. It all hinges on this. Knight e3 forks the two rooks. But no, I have a check on c8. And without this check, none of this would have worked. This is what these games always come down to, these very tiny tactical details. You have to see them, otherwise you're not going to spot the right approach. You know, what this reminds me of is like in football, American football, you have the best quarterbacks can throw, can, can, you know the phrase, thread the needle. They can pass, Tom Brady can pass, you know, to a receiver who's got four defenders around him. And he can thread the needle and can do that with 95% accuracy. Like he will throw an interception once every hundred times. And um, you got to be able to do that in chess. You have to be able to embrace the complexity and spot these details. Otherwise, you're going to, you know, these opportunities are going to fall by the wayside. So hopefully you guys are able to follow the logic here. Bishop c4 takes, takes. Now, he doesn't go knight e3. Here he makes a big mistake. I think that this was maybe his last chance to 
to get himself good drawing chances or his second to last chance. I think he should have stopped my rook from infiltrating by going bishop c5. I think he should have gone bishop c5. Well, I'm up in exchange. He has an extra pawn, but I have two rooks to his one rook. So I have a material advantage, not a big one, but what really helps me here is this pawn on e5 is a huge, it's, it's a hero because it's protected by the bishop and it's tying down his rook. So white's plan here is just to activate my rooks and just infiltrate the back ranks. The Jeffrey goes b5, he chases my rook away and I'm like, thank you very much. I give him, gave him a check. Now his king is really vulnerable. I've got g4 ideas, but not immediately. Not immediately because of knight e3. And I wasn't impressed with this. Uh, so the point is to activate this other rook on f1. It's not an IQP, it's a king pawn, but it's, you can think of it as an isolated pawn, but it's well, it's nonetheless, it's well protected. Yeah, so rook d1 is what Jeffrey was hoping for. This is a mistake. It's a mistake because the knight jumps around here, knight e3, and sorry. And as impressive as this appears, he goes knight c4 and my pawns start to collapse. You want to be very careful, not give up any pawns here that you don't want to, that you don't need to. So I first play rook f3. This is a very, very powerful move. I just stopped the knight from coming to e3. And the thing is, he can adopt an alternate route to c4, which he did, but that comes at a cost. He goes knight b6, but now he gives my other rook a chance to, to get to the seventh rank, and that's pretty devastating. Knight c4, whoops, ugh, keep doing that, sorry. Rook c7, knight c4, and bishop c3. And it turns out that despite the fact that my pawns are hanging, my rooks are sufficiently active here, and he's not able to take, you know, he can only take one pawn at a time. He takes on e5. If he took on a3, which maybe he should have, but I can just take the one on a7. He takes on e5. I swing the rook to h3. Now I'm hitting this pawn. He has to defend it. And now I take the other pawn. The great thing about this bishop placement is that it's covering the e1 square. So he has no ideas, you know, that involve moving the knight and giving checkmate. And the rest is a matter of just picking up. This pawn on b5 is now a huge weakness. He's pinned all over the place. I think objectively, maybe the computer can, can still hold a draw here, but practically speaking, I think it's basically lost. Jeffrey goes f4. He tries to arrest this rook. But I don't care. My rook is chilling on h3. I go rook b7. Now he can't defend the pawn on b5. Rook c6. Boom. Obviously not. Bishop takes e5. You get checkmated. Bishop f6. Drop the rook back to b1 to cover the back rank. Knight g4, and now one final accurate move is required. One final accurate move is required. Do not take the bishop because you get forked. So what should white do here to just essentially end all of black's counterplay? Yeah, well, king g1 blunders the... Don't blunder the bishop. Don't blunder the bishop. The bishop is attacked. So there's two threats to deal with. You've got to defend against both of them, and you do that by playing bishop e1. And the game is over because now... No more fork, I have the passer, and it's just a matter of, of pushing this passer and getting a rook behind it, which I did. Rook c2, rook f3, g5, h3, get the knight out, rook f2, and rook a2. So I got the rook behind the pawn, and I literally just pushed this pawn all the way to the end. I just pushed this pawn all the way to the end. F3, I don't care, bishop a4, you can do whatever he wants to do. Rook e4, bishop g3, and I just gave up the bishop, but... In return, I, I promoted the pawn. So the, I'm going fast here, but this is very, very straightforward. Um, there was one more last detail that I will share, which is that instead of Jeffrey's move f3, I think he had a far more resilient idea, defensive idea. And that was to play knight c3, a4, rook e4. This was a far more resilient defensive idea. And the point is that the bishop is hanging. I don't want to go to a5. I don't want to block the progress of my own pawn. And if I go to d2... He somehow gets a lot of counterplay because rookie two, and now he's got all these checks. Already, I don't think black is worse. So I was a little bit scared of this position, but then I spotted an idea. What if I just go a5 and give up the bishop? So there is some beautiful lines here. If knight takes e1, it's very simple. I go a6, bishop d4, and just a7. And the point here is that his king is all of a sudden in massive trouble. King f6, rook, rook a6. If he goes back, then I give him a ladder mate. If he goes to f5, then I give him another check and I start laddering him. Rook b6, rook a7, rook b8. This is winning. But if he plays rook takes e1, the situation is more complicated. Rook e1, rook e1, knight e1. And 
after a6 bishop d4 white has to be super precise because if he has if, if you go a7 this is actually a draw the three on two is an easy draw for black so what you have to do here is use the vulnerable position of the bishop and the knight you go rook e2 hit the knight force it back to d3 and now rook d2 and if knight f2 checking g1 there's no way to save both of these pieces at once knight h3 king f1 black's pieces fall apart the one other detail here is that if he tries to go knight c3 and knight b4 and basically says, I'm going to give up the bishop but take the pawn in return, because of the awkward placement of the knight, I go rook d5. And it, amazingly, it turns out that he cannot defend this pawn. Because if he brings his king up, I fork the king and the rook. And without this detail, again, I think this position is probably a draw. Now, this was an insane sequence. I showed this in the commentary after the game. I had calculated this, and I was actually kind of hoping he would go for it, but... He didn't end up even going knight d3. He went f3, which is totally innocuous and lets me push my pawn. So, yeah, cool calculations, but that ended up remaining behind the scenes. So, that's that. So, that's the second game. All right, now I'm going to get going. I'm super tired. But for now, I'm going to head out, watch some basketball, and, and chill. Um, just really appreciate you guys watching. I hope, hope I was able to somewhat coherently illustrate some of these details. But I uh, just want to thank everybody for, for watching. See you guys later. Thank you so much for hanging out.